started, I'm going to give a very short introduction and then we we'll turn this over to Jen and Amelia. Um, so the Sustainable Agriculture yeah. Program and the Growing Maine Project invited Jen and Amelia to come speak today because um, they're a pretty good example of young farmers in Maine implementing what um, could be considered best practices in farming. And they're going to talk to us about their farm, which is Ararat Farms. They have been the primary farmers at Ararat Farms since 2010. Um, and I'm not going to say much about their farm and practices because that's what they're here to do. So, welcome, Amelia and Jen. And Silas and Red. So I will forward it and tell you. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. Um, as as Heather was saying, Amelia and I are at the Ararat Farms in Lake in Lake and Domain. Applesauce. We're over an hour from here on the coast, Lake and Domain, between Camden and Belfast. Oh yeah. Heather, can you do the next slide? I can. Uh, we are a certified organic LLT farm growing mixed vegetables for wholesale markets. Uh, we are committed to providing our customers with food that's superior in nutrition, freshness, and flavor to the standard grocery store offering. And when we pose ourselves, we see our competition as the quote unquote imported produce from California and elsewhere. Um, so our express mission is to supplant uh, on grocery store shelves stuff that's coming in from out of state. Um, and that, that's our that's our goal. This is our salad mix that we just harvested yesterday and one today and that's one of the we have. Uh, Heather, can you give the next slide? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we are focused oh, go back one. It's moving by itself. Thank you. We are focused on wholesaling as our primary marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, our whole business plan is based off of a study that was done, I think this is now about six years old, that shows where most Mainers go and buy their food. Um, and if you look at it, what it shows you is, you know, in each section, uh, each, each of the columns is a location that they get their food from. And then it's broken down into three bars, each of those columns, um, and representing where they get that share of their food. So the the furthest left column over there is farm direct market. That would be a farmer's market, CSA share, farm stand, so on like that. And what you see down here is this teeny little green bar right there. That's about 5% of people get more than half of their produce from a farm direct market. Those represent the kind of hardcore locavores that um, we all love to think about and, and that you know, uh, are often the focus of most farm business plans. They're the kinds of people that are going to go and buy a CSA share or you know, patronize a farm stand on a very regular basis. The farmer's market's regular. That's, that's those folks there. What this study shows is that that's a relatively small percentage of the overall population of the state of um, And that the vast majority of people still tend to try, try to get their food at the grocery store within 10 miles of where they live. Um, so for us, when we were developing our business plan, uh, we said, well, we want to take local foods um, and get it outside of the existing uh, uh, markets, like farmers markets and CSAs and so on, and try to get more local foods into places where people are already shopping. Um, that is partly because we feel like there's a large untapped group of people that would buy more local food if it was in some place they were already going to. Um, and also because the direct markets at least in the highly populated areas of the state of Maine are, are starting to get saturated to a certain degree. Um, it's fairly common now for instance, for most farmers markets to uh, you know kind of limit the limit the membership in spe specific markets because they feel like they don't they can't dilute themselves out any further. There's too many vendors and not enough customers. Yeah, and part of the start is because we are people who shop at hampers because it's so much easier. We can get our diapers there, we can get a lot of different stuff there. We go to the co-ops around us whenever we can, but mm -hmm. you know, we're busy and we go to hampers because it's easier. And we started okay. shopping there and we would go over and look at and say, that's terrible. We could definitely, definitely use better products. No one, I can't believe people are buying um, that sort of, and then we're like, hmm, well, maybe we, can, maybe we can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that was one of the things we noticed about the organic products that we're getting that we're sitting on 
on the shelves at, at Hannaford's and other grocery stores. One, they were weak, of very poor quality. Um, and two, they were really pretty expensive, fairly highly priced, um, which translates to a higher margin for us or for any farm that wants to work in Hannaford. And also, um, there's a lot of reasons, I think, that the, the produce model that, that uh, larger grocery stores have been working with is starting to weaken now. Um, you know, there's higher fuel prices, and it's more expensive for them to work with their nationally based distributors. Um, there's big droughts going on in places like California at the moment. Um, so the time is right. To, that, that's what we felt. The time is right to start working with larger uh, uh, supermarket chains. Okay, the next one. Hey. We also do all of this with the so far children, which makes it more entertaining and also more complicated. <laughs> Um, a little bit about our production practices. We are a certified organic vegetable farm. Um, most of our layer chickens are certified, but they're very <coughs> part of the operations, mostly vegetables. Uh, next year we're going to have about eight acres in production. Last year we had about seven. Um, we are also GAP certified, which stands for Good Agricultural Practice Certified. That is a series of regulations that have to do with food hygiene, uh, uh, sorry, food safety and hygienic handling practices. Um, we got that certification primarily so we could sell at the Hannaford supermarkets because they require it. It's very daunting, but it's much easier than you would think, and a lot of it is very straightforward, kind of basic, obvious stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of it is extra record keeping. Um, on a time scale, it's about as cumbersome as being organically certified, the amount of records that you actually have to keep. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff, if you've already worked in, uh, uh, you know, restaurant industry or any kind of food preparation industry you'd be very familiar with. Um, it was news to us, like we have to clean our bathroom every week and then vlog that we cleaned our bathroom and check our sheet that we changed the toilet paper and stuff like that. Um, which wasn't actually that hard to get into once we, once we got used to it. Um, um, sometimes I feel like when people are telling you about gap certification, they kind of give you the worst case scenario stuff. They say, oh, you know, these are all the things that you need to cover. But in reality, when you get down into the details, they say things like, oh, you just need to tell us whether or not you have a policy on here. You don't actually have to have a policy. You just have to say yes or no about whether or not you have one. And that's how a lot of the details are. The other thing is you don't have to have a perfect score to pass gap, unlike organic certification. If you put one thing down that's not organic, you can lose that whole field for four years. With the gap, you have to score, I think it's 70% or 80%, 75%, something like that. Um, in order to pass. Uh, our, our, our production practices, we also focus on producing nutrient-dense vegetables. Um, so we are you know, always trying to create vegetables that have really good shelf life and a really good flavor, you know, beyond just being certified organic, because that doesn't necessarily guarantee those things, um, although it's a, it's a good first step. Um, so what that means in practice is that we are very intensive and high input in our production practices. Um, so we, you know, we use a lot of uh, compost and other fertilizers. We use a lot of shell meal. You know, that's our primary nitrogen-based fertilizer. Um, and we do a lot. Of, you can see up in that upper right-hand corner. We do a lot of spraying, a uh, whole foliar spraying in terms of the fertilizer. We apply a lot of fertilizers that way. Um, and then we do quite a fair amount of pest control that way. Um, we're always scouting for pests and applying based on what we, if, uh, if our pest damages reach a certain threshold. Um, in general, we're trying to hybridize the intensity, the, the intensity of direct market gardening with the efficiency of mechanized row cropping. So we're trying to take some of the things that uh, you know, the farmers like Elliot Coleman do in terms of the compost inputs per acre and in terms of the bed spacing and the plantings and so on and apply what we can to a larger setting. Um, you know, for instance, our standard bed widths are 220 to 300 feet long, so it's much longer than like, someone that would be working strictly by hand. Um, and I would say with that third point, we definitely haven't perfected that yet. That's just where we're trying to go. We haven't perfected anything. Ongoing, ongoing process. Excellent. Uh, so the farm district, uh, Amelia and I did not own the farm. Uh, this, was, this property was Helmstock Farm, which was a rare breeds of livestock conservancy, uh, not for profit, for about 10 years. Um, it shut down in the early part of last decade, I think it was. Um, the property was purchased by Dr. Daryl Arnie in 2010. Um, he hired us at that point to manage the farm in fall of 2010. At that point, we were just, we weren't
weren't really trying to start a commercial farm at that point. We were managing the property for him more and growing about an acre of vegetables for his family. Um, the original intent, we were the caretakers for the, for the Tom Scott farm. For, for Tom Scott farm, it was vacant. And, uh, and um, <coughs> Gara purchased it. Um, the idea was that it was just going to be a place for his family from New York to come to, and that we were just supposed to have vegetables to put on their table when they got there. Because he had been farming um, for about five years in Massachusetts, and so we liked the idea. We said, hey, let's sell some. Can you sell some? And he said, sure. And then it sort of, every year we got a little bit more carried away, and, and uh, now we're where we are. Uh, and Gara was involved in the cancer research that came straight to say, and just about the time that he purchased his farm, he um, got on the, you know, he wrote the China Study, which is a book about eating plant-based diet, um, and he's very convinced that this is the, the primary and best method of, uh, uh, you know, upon preventing it and even reversing cancer, so this is changing the diet. So this became a very kind of personal issue for him, um, stemming from that side of it. Well, he also became vegan right after he bought it, it was pretty ironic that it was basically built to be a livestock farm. So all of our infrastructure was built for hundreds of sheep, for instance. It's very interesting. Um, uh, so in 2011, we did, we did a little bit of everything. Um, let's see. So we, we grew about an acre of vegetables. We had a small farm stand. We did do a small CSA that year. Um, we did a bunch of cutting in the woods. We hosted six Armenian youth for six weeks. We were all across the board. Uh, it was basically whatever Garo, he wanted to try a little bit of everything. So we were just doing things for him at that point. Um, but then in 2012, we decided to get a little bit more serious with the business, and we focused on wholesaling, and we got our GAP and organic certifications. Um, and we started selling locally to the Hannaford grocery stores in the Midcoast area that year. And, and the healthy stores in the area, too. We had maybe five or six restaurants and, and um, healthy stores that we were selling to. Um, in 2013, this last growing season, we that this was this was our biggest year of growth. Um, we were selling, the, we switched tactics and we started selling products directly to the Hanford warehouse. Um, so Hanford supermarkets lets you deliver one of two ways. Once you get into their system, you can either call their individual stores and talk to the produce manager and sell stuff directly to the store, like it's any other uh, account. That's a nightmare, by the way. If anyone's interested in trying it, or wouldn't. We it did not. It did not work very well for us. Uh, we ended up switching packages to selling directly to their warehouse, which is down in South Portland, and that's their distribution hub for all of Northern New England. And so you deliver stuff there, and they sh put it on all their trucks. Their whole system is set up to work that way more than a direct store delivery route. The produce managers prefer to work from the warehouse because I think it's a lot easier for them than to have to deal with a whole bunch of other different people calling them all the time. Um, and we found that the volume just got a lot higher when we started doing that. Um, so you know, they're buying, uh, you know, in much larger blocks and then divvying it up themselves. And so what we did was we concentrated on a uh, smaller suite of crops last year, um, primarily green kale and also rainbow cherries. But we were their only supplier of organic green of kale last year. Yes. Do they tell you where that food goes? Like, do you know if they're selling it to like? Their flagship stores, or if it's being equally distributed around the region. It's it's right now. It's basically the the orders come from all. It's distributed equally around the region, but then that's how it started off. And then each individual store will call in and place an order. They do. They did um, the top ninety six stores for certain items that they wanted to push out. Like we did cherry tomato pints, and we did um, when we first started with rainbow carrots bag. They did that. They did that way as well. So it's, it depends upon the product. Kale, though, is just basically people order. We essentially replaced organic California. Organic kale in California. Um, we also restructured our staff 
to separate the harvest and pack crews. We started paying the harvest crew piecework. That is, we paid everyone 40 cents per bunch of kale they harvested last year. Um, that was a major breakthrough for us. Uh, all of a sudden, the output doubled per hour. So incentive matters, we learned very quickly. Um, <laughs> and, and it also weeds out the, the people that aren't as maybe as good workers. They just decide this is not the job for them, and they move on pretty quickly. We, we also um, we used to be farm educators when we were in Massachusetts, and so part of us, part of it is that we kind of always end up bringing on staff, young people who we feel like we can, you know, we feel like there's potential there for that, and so we ended up with some employees who were, you know, dig their hands into the soil, and then they would pick peas, and then their hands would be all muddy, and they were picking peas, and, and, and then they were also just spacing out and sort of looking around and not really paying attention to they were harvesting and we were paying like $7.50 an hour to do that and then once we started doing the piece work, all of a sudden that potential that we thought we saw we saw on some of those people really started to come through. Actually one of these boys is coming back next year and she's really excited about it. So it worked for a lot of ways. Uh, plans for 2014, we're going to continue expanding sales to Hannaford. We had a good meeting with them about a month ago. Um, we're going to continue selling them the green kale. They want to try to purchase lots of natto kale this year. This is the, if you're connected with the health and food, this is the new hot kale. You know, it's been around in farm, farm market forever, but for some reason now, everyone in the mainstream world thinks that dinosaur kale is the best thing in the universe. Um, so it's up and coming. The most um, kale kale. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe that's it. I don't know. Somehow it's true. <laughs> the, the whole green kale thing got started basically because Dr. Ross about four years ago said that everyone needs to start eating kale. And then, Started eating kale. Um, and that's why Hanford wanted to start buying kale from us, is because their kale sales have been just taking up and up and up and up. Um, but, you know, we have questions about whether or not that's a, a, you know, a trend that was temporary. <coughs> how, much, how much of your production is you trying to guess and market to them what we have, or them telling you what they want? Ideally, as little as possible is a guess. Um, yeah. the, the way it works for us is we try to go out to all of our customers and uh, gauge what their uh, sales are, are, are going to be of our products. And uh, then we build our planting plan around that. And we, we have a little bit of a buffer for error in the margin. Um, but so they won't tell you they want 100 pounds this week and the next week say, actually, we only want. What, what yeah. Hanford? Well, there's a little bit of give and take in that. But I mean, especially with the smaller customers. With Hanford, I mean, it's, it's such big numbers that, um, I mean, normally we say, this is how many pounds we're going to have, and this is how long we think we're going to have it for, and then they just go ahead and place orders like, I think maybe, maybe 50 cases of 12 bunches of kale three times a week is what we were doing. Actually, like on average, or sort of a low week. And then, you know, sometimes it's like 74 <coughs> cases for one of those orders, and sometimes it's more like 38 cases. It sort of mm -hmm. fluctuates, but... Yeah, for, for the... For the the best example of that when it really works is the green kale because Hanford's already carrying organic green kale. And they, I mean, they pay people their entire jobs to sit there and look at what they've sold and, and, and analyze these trends and these forecast standards. Um, and so they, they can just, you know, hit a button on our computer and it says, oh, our average organic green kale sales this year is probably going to be this. And then they tell us that. Um, but actually, the rainbow, rainbow carrots is a good example because we're selling two pound bags of rainbow carrots this year. And we said, we have about 5,500 pounds. And we said to them, um, that's not what we've got. That's and somewhere in the, in the communication world, because communication is always a complicated thing with this huge store like this, um, they said, OK, we're going to order them three times a week. And they ordered them three times a week. And we were out in like two weeks, because they, they tried them. They sent them out to those 96 stores. And they tried them, and people were buying more and more and more, and everybody wanted them. So we ended up running out, and we didn't have them for very long. So next year, we're going to focus yeah. on, it, on making sure we have enough and sort of cementing those numbers as much yeah. as we can, because it really makes a big difference. Yeah. We, we, we want as many of these numbers cemented by the end of February as possible. That's our goal. The, the whole planning plan is basically written. And we don't really, you know, hopefully, we don't have to go into it and rework it in June. And that's going to be a nightmare. Um, and, um, so we are expanding the, you know, the last amount of kale, we're going to expand the carrot production to try to get to a reliable, consistent weekly volume that they know that we can plan for. Um, onions, red, red and yellow is the same thing. Um, and they are you're selling organic red and yellow onions, so it's pretty easy for them to calculate. And uh, head lettuce is too. 
Um, we're looking to double our growth again this year, or maybe even a little bit more around that is our target. Um, continue, we're continuing to intensify our production, our bed spacing, we start out fairly wide on our bed spacing and we're working on shrinking it and shrinking it the better we get with our equipment and the more specialized we get with our equipment. Um, and in the field, it, so when I say in the field, I mean in, in the vast majority of those, the eight acres that I was referring to, we're going we're gonna to grow basically for those four crops um, uh, in, in those entire eight acres. And if you look at it, we try, we try to select crops both that have high demand but are also in different families, so that if one disease or pest wipes out, there's still free understanding. Um, and then in the greenhouses, we have about a total of a little over a third of an acre in greenhouse production. That's where we're going to go in diversity of stuff. We've got, I think, about 80 different crops that are going in, in very tight succession. Um, and, that's, and those, the greenhouses serve primarily on local markets. So um, and then the other thing that we're starting working on this year is to develop our own composting system. Since we've only been growing on this land for three years, we've been kind of coasting on the residual nutrients left in the sod. Where last year we started to see that we were going to start adding back, and um, we did some numbers, and we're going to have to start putting like 30 plus CRs of compost per acre in. And if we have to start buying that, um, it's going to get very expensive. So we're, we're working on developing our own composting this year. That's going to be pretty cool for us. Who's the organic farmer? Organic certification. Do you still use the, the basic salt for your fertilizers? No, um, you have to use you have to use fertilizers that meet the the OMRI that, that are passable under the organic standards. So it's going to be like chicken manure or, or yeah. I mean, there are lots of different bag fertilizers out there that you can buy and you know, stuff off the shelf that are organic. Um, so so it's not that you can't, you have to use just chicken manure or something like that. Right. There it's, it's always, it's always going to be an organic kind of It organic. has to come from organic chemistry. Yeah, it has to be derived from It can't, can't okay. be like, uh, like, you know, there's stuff we use in the backyard farm. You just go to the bag, you know, process. I, I mean, it's, it's, either mine, it's either mine from sea salt or it's mine from the mine in the ground. <laughs> I mean, there, there are bag things that are certifiable, and there are some of them are mine. Um, oh, okay. and they, what they look at when they review them is not necessarily, okay. they take some of those factors into account, but a lot of it has to do with what goes into making the stuff that's in the bag and how it's made. Okay. Um, it has to generally have to be, it has to be a living process. It has to be, it has to come from something that was uh, biologically produced. Okay. But, they, but there are things that are mined. You can buy, you know, like zeolite, for instance, is organically certified, um, but it's mine, you know, it's a mine product from New Mexico. But it's a mineral. Mixing some intensive acid into it to break it down, then that would not be certified, for instance. Were you saying you used a lot of alfalfa meal for your nitrogen? No, uh, crab meal. Crab meal. Oh, okay. This is our major, uh, you know, quick, quick fertility input. And we get that from New Brunswick. Um, we're trying to figure out how to get it from Maine. Our goal is to source everything that we possibly can locally from all of our inputs through our labor. Um, and, and in general, we do a pretty good job of that. Um, I'd love to get the crab meal in state if we could figure out. You know, there are some places that are processing it. A lot of them are locked into contracts with composters and things like that, so it's hard to find them. Um, that, that would be a great goal for us if we could get a local crab source. Is the shellfish waste um, flowable or in liquid form? It, it's, flow, it's dry. Um, it's not quite flowable. Um, it does not go through a spin spreader. We have tried, and it just comes up. Um, so what we have, what we end up doing is we end up putting it in our spreaders with compost. Okay. Spreader, spreading it out that way. Um, ideally, it's actually best if it's mixed into compost a week or two before it's applied um, to give the biology and the compost a chance to kind of digest it and stuff. So that's that's the or we fill it into the soil and then wait a week. So you don't, you're not applying that mid season. We do, we do apply it mid-season. Ideally, if we're perfect, yeah, we, we budget it perfectly and, and it's all done for um, you know, In practice, we end up side dressing with it, yes. Um, so 2014, uh, this is our totally self-interested plug that we're going to put in now. Um, we are looking for 
three internship positions this year to help us with primarily the fruit, uh, har uh, the work prior to harvest, field work prior to harvest, um, although there will be some harvesting too. Um, what we really want to do this year, we posted, we posted apprentices from Mock in the past, what we really want to do this year is to develop work study programs that match the intern's learning goals um, with one of our learning management areas, as we call it. Uh, this is all to say that we really want to find interns who are considering sustainable agriculture as a career. Um, that's really who we prefer to, to, to put into these internships, which means that they have things they really want to learn in specific, specific skills. Um, so we've identified learning, in what we call learning management areas, which are areas of the farm production that consist of work that we need done, but also kind of a, a little enterprise, autonomous enterprise in and of itself. And what we like to try to do is find, have each intern take one of these on and have it be something that they're really directly responsible for for the duration of their internship. In addition to doing other work, I mean, I won't say that we're all, we're all gonna go out and read the carrots when we have to. Um, but that's, our, that's what we would like to do this year. Um, the, the learning management areas that we have at the moment available, pest control, farm stand management, tractor skills, weed control, greenhouse seedling propagation, produce packaging and handling, and that's if you're interested in the gap, that would be a major uh, component of that, and then forestry. Um, that's our entire presentation. I think we'll have time Oh, we use the yang seed um, for everything. Uh, Is that the, the uh, no, that's actually a little low. I don't have a picture of the yang seed. There. It's J A N G yang, um, and it, it's by far the best seeder we've ever encountered. Is it three point hitch? Yeah. No, no, it's you push it by hand. Oh. And so far, uh, any any uh, you know, every time we've looked at different kinds of. You know, if we were to get really big and get a vacuum heater or something for the tractor, we uh, <coughs> not at that scale where it makes sense for us to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Yang seeder is just by far the most reliable. And that's tool. something that we've been planting 30 inches wide, 30 rows. We're, yeah, we actually go to one, our rows are now spaced at one foot apart. We have a 36 inch bed with three rows in it. Um, and the rows are marked with a, with a tractor. Um, the bed is made and the rows are marked with the tractor. And um, uh, then we plant by hand, you know, seeded by hand with the yang seeder. And then we have a water wheel transplant and a permanent transplant. Is that because your cultivators will go down? Yeah, the cultivators are set up to do that, although this year we're getting away from tractor cultivating. We're focused more on time eating and cleaning. Oh. Um, so we're trying to retire the cultivators mm -hmm. if we can. What was your biggest challenge
by far the most knowledgeable person that can help you. Um, that and the state themselves, you know, they have that information, but they're a little bit less. It's hard to decipher what they have. Linda Titus is the person. Yeah, they're really very helpful. They're nice. I'm not trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to get more farmers to do this. And she used to, when she used to have a grant where she would come out for free and get into a two hour consultation. I don't know if that grant still runs or not, but it does, it was great. Is there like classroom, classroom work involved? Or like, um, you just kind of read the requirements and do it, and then someone comes to your farm? How does that yeah, work? Yeah, so you have to have a, food, a farm safety plan or a food safety plan that you have to write, and, and it works, you know, it walks through everything, every aspect of your production, and uh, you, know, you identify risks that could potentially contaminate your produce, and you talk about what you're going to do to uh, you know, prevent those risks. And there's a certain number of things that have to be in that plan um, in order for it to become a, a viable gap plan. Um, again, Linda has a template that I'm sure she would just share with anyone. And we just took the template and uh, you know, uh, modified it on these. Mm -hmm. It was very simple. It, it, there are some for different things. Like last year, we actually did it. We got a permit last year. Which really <laughs> but the year before, we got points taken off because we didn't know that you have to um, you had to have a plan in place as to what would happen if your toilet overflowed. There had to be like a contingency plan in place. But that's literally a sentence in the plan that says, you know, we'll isolate the area with these markers and call in a company to come and mop it up and yeah. anything, any produce within this area will be, you know, marked contaminated and not some. And then they, they come out, there's a schedule visit where they come out and it's like mocked up, except it takes way longer, it's maybe like Four hours? Four hours. Four hours. Oh, it's, it's, a lot, it's long. And you pay for it, of course, you know. So, um, and, but it's similar in terms of the record keeping and the information you need to give them. And then there's a, a surprise visit where they show up and it's always the absolute worst possible day you can imagine them showing up. And everyone's terrified and they're shaking. And they ask your like, employees random questions. They'll like circle around and they'll find like the one like 15 year old kid in the corner and say, Where, how are you supposed to sneeze? I said, bless you, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, and, but it's worked out, it's not, it's not, and that's part of it, you have to make sure you're training your employees so that they're signing a form. Oh, and actually, we did lose points, not not this year, but the year before, because we we didn't actually sign training forms, we didn't train each other. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, we did this with the, every year you have to train all your employees and handle produce, and then they have to sign a sheet. And actually, I would also say that your office meeting, you have to make sure that all the ones that are on, they make sure that all of us who work in the greenhouse get this training. Everyone in your case, you actually work in the field. Because we're also handling So you actually need to sign. That's right. Since we're handling produce, I mean, even though you don't want to take that, you can everybody else. You also have to um, and, and there's some really, really awesome things about the GAP certification, and this is actually one of the hardest things, too, is the traceability aspect. And that stems from, like, E. coli scare with spinach and everything like that. Um, so when you harvest something, you have a lot number, you have a harvest date, you have a pack date, and then you, you, you have to be able to trace and do a mock recall with all your employees, not your employees, your, uh, all of your customers. And so every single item that goes into the cooler, a little training in the background. Uh, every item that goes into the cooler is, you know exactly where it came from. And if you had to recall, you have to have that available. And it's actually, it's super awesome to have that kind of information available. Do, do you have different lots of the same crop at the same yeah. time? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, we define our lot as a, a specific crop harvested from a specific field on a specific date. That's how we, that's how we, you know, so it's harvested the next day, it's a different lot. When you do the gap um, thing, do you have to do it for every single vegetable item you're going to be growing? You do. There is a gap program for every commodity item. Well, we are but what Hannaford's only requires that you're gap certified in one commodity. That may vary depending on the customer you want to work with. But that's the way they look at it. So we're gap certified for leafy greens, for instance. But we sell them all kinds of things that aren't leafy greens, too. So, so they don't care. Somebody could be picking their meat nose and then harvesting beets. And as long as they're not harvesting something like the salad mix or the leafy greens, when the gap auditor 
Like we tried to show them, we I, we tried to show them a, someone harvesting beets one time, and they said, "I can't talk to that person. It has to be a person harvesting kale." But that, beet but that's actually changing. That's that they're tightening up on that kind of stuff. And yeah. I've station pack stations don't didn't need to be certified um, at the time that we got our certification, but that's changed. Yeah. I don't think that has changed yet. Oh, it's, well, it's it's coming, right? The rock paper paper. Paper. No, uh, the, the, to the toilet can be outside portable toilet once it's clean, mm -hmm. but the hand washing station has to be hot pressurized water. It's a, it's a portable hot pressurized water. And that has to be within the packing station, like we have one in a, in a processing kitchen. It, it actually cannot be in the pack station itself. It has to have, it cannot have access from the pack station. What they're trying to prevent is somebody walking through the bathroom into the pack station. Like you have to have a boot washing area, ideally a sanitizing spot for your boots as you're walking in. Way easier said than done. Um, and when we built our pack station, we actually had a separate entrance to the bathroom from the back of it, which gets annoying, but you can see you know, the importance of it. But, I mean, for us, when it, it's not the, the bathroom is not a great challenge because we're in one location where a lot of people run into trouble with gaps if they're leasing fields elsewhere or if the farm is spread out over multiple properties that are sort of a quarter mile apart, then it becomes a real issue. Um, which kind of gives you the part of when we were looking at ways to expand our production last year, you know, we were looking at getting trying to figure out if we could get more acreage at least somehow, or if we could figure out to how we could invest our truck. So for instance, like we went from two rows per bed to three. And one of the reasons we decided to, to focus on intensifying was because that way we didn't have to deal with all this infrastructure problem. That was gonna really make it difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. I recently heard the, uh, some of the folks that learned about the border quality, yeah. yep. they also learned about a thing that is a, uh, a sink with a cup of cold water that's just a uh, propane yep. hot water tank. That would be really useful. So that, work, that works really good in the that would solve that problem. That would that would definitely solve that problem. Have to have right. Yeah. No. That would definitely solve that problem. I love to get. I love their contact information. Uh, what is the name of your story? The top end. so huge that the boiler can barely keep up with it. Um, and so 
what we were finding was that the, the cost of wood that we were consuming and the cost of energy to pump the heat was was larger than the net, it was higher than the net added production that we were getting. So the plants, the, the, the crops that we grow over winter survive in an unheated tunnel with double cover over it. They just don't really grow. If you heat them, they'll grow a little bit faster. But not not the production's not worth the heat. So you you've got your high tunnel and you've got low cover. That's right. You've got some finished plant that has grown, say, by mid November. That's right. You it, and you can sell off of that amount throughout the winter. That's right. That's, that's you're, not gonna, you're not going to get a lot of new growth, but you can keep the crop preserved. That's right. Right around now is when it starts to grow again. Yeah. Yeah. Very cold, but it did. You know, most of the most of the crops that we grow did survive. Yeah. Yeah, for us, our, our struggle is we always it, uh, you have to plant them by the third week in October, and we always that's such a very busy time of year. So, so our struggle is always making sure that we get it. Yeah. So, yeah, getting the tunnel switched over and planted at that time of year is always a, a huge struggle for us. Because if you miss like a week late, all of a sudden you get no crop versus having a full crop. It's, it's really a very tight schedule. Mark Fulford, you mentioned him like the doctor of soil. Um, how would we locate him or where does he work? Um, how does he, that work? He was Farm. Tultane? If you Google Mark Fulford, Teltane Farm, it would almost certainly come up. Uh, look Far Ag Services, I think is the shingle that he has. Oh, um, The guinea fowl are, are, yeah, we've definitely discussed scuttling them many times. They actually, they do a pretty good job of just staying around. I mean, we keep the glass short, so there's less bugs where they want to go, right? And so because of that, they go into like the edges and eat the ticks. And they're so entertaining. Yeah, that's why I got them. We have a horrible tick problem. Yeah, yeah. They, we have no ticks on now, I mean, in terms of the, the wildlife or, or animals getting into fields and the gap, but that's a, that people often wonder how that's because the inspectors get to interpret the law. That's kind of how it is. That's what the law says. They they look for you to have shown that you tried to keep animals out. So you need to put up some kind of barrier and say I did this to keep animals out. So for us, it's one strand of electric fence around the field, so we made it with peanut butter, and it keeps the deer out. Yeah. It's going to be. 
be, no, it, it, we do that, for, is it harvest that we're supposed to do that kind of marking? Yeah. It's up to your, your gap, is, there's a lead way. And and they're pretty, at least we found that inspectors have, we've had it been relatively reasonable. As long as we're open and honest with that. They, they also do a really good job of saying, you know, well, this isn't a problem for you now. It's not actually in the, the manual, but this is what I would recommend. Because if you don't do this, then you might end up getting into trouble some years down the road. Like, um, we had bins that we were spraying out, and then they, once they were clean, they were laying upside down, stacked in our wash room. And she said, you got to get those up off the ground. And, and we were like, oh, yeah, you're right. We really do have to get those up off the ground. Right. Well, we, we have them like that. We have them like that. And she still was like, but you never know. I mean, things are going to spray around. And, I mean, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.